Uh, we're really lucky to have the members of the Middle Eastern Studies Association here in New Orleans. We have so many wonderful scholarly events here in the city. Uh, I'm going to introduce our illustrious panelists and then join you all to watch their discussion, which promises to be fascinating and important. Uh, I'm going to start with our friends who are joining us via Skype. Uh, we have, and if you'll just wave because you don't have the fancy nameplates that we have down here. Uh, our first panelist via Skype is Trigul oh. Keskin. Can you, Professor Keskin? Uh, Keskin is a professor of international relations and director of the Center for Global Governance at Shanghai University in China. Uh, he was the graduate director of the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Maltepe University in Istanbul, Turkey. And he taught previously in the Department of International and Global Studies and is an affiliated faculty of Black Studies uh, in Sociology at, in the Center for Turkish Studies at Portland State University here in the States in Portland, Oregon. He's also editor-in-chief of the Sociology of Islam, which is a journal published by Brill. Uh, also joining us via Skype is uh, Amur El Assam. He is a professor of Shawnee State University. Uh, Dr. Assam was educated in the UK, reading archaeology of Western Asiatics at University College London, and graduated with a doctoral degree in 1981, in 1991, as did I. So you know, uh, same year. He was the founder and director of the Scientific and Conservation Laboratories at the General Department of Antiquities and Museums between 1999 and 2004 and taught at the University of Damascus until 2006. From 2006 to 2009, he was a visiting assistant professor at Brigham Young University and is currently professor of Middle East History and Anthropology at Shawnee State University in Ohio. While working on in Syria, uh, Amir was first-hand observer and sometimes participant of the reform processes instigated by Bashar al-Assad, thus gaining insights into how they were enacted and why more often than not they failed. Furthermore, he is a keen follower and commentator on current events in Syria and the Middle East in general and has written articles in numerous journals, major media outlets, including guest editorials for the New York Times, Time Magazine, and Foreign Policy. He's also a founder and board member of the Day After Project and coordinates the Heritage Project Initiative, TD TDA HPI for Cultural Heritage, uh, it, which is part of TDA. He's also co-director of the Antiquities Trafficking and Heritage Anthropology uh, Research Project and co-founder of ACO. Uh, Nadine Shahadi <coughs> is the current executive director of Lebanese American uh, of Lebanese American University's New York headquarters and academic center, and an associate fellow at Chatham House, where he's formerly head of the Middle East program. He was previously director of the Farris Center for Eastern Mediterranean <coughs> Studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. From 1986 to 2005, he served as director of Lebanese studies at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Uh, Mohammed Tavakoli Targi is professor of history and Near East and Middle Eastern civilizations at the University of Toronto. Since 2002, he has served in for, uh, as the editor-in-chief of Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, which is a Duke University Press journal. He is co-editor of, Ira of an Iranian studies book series for AIS Routledge and editor-in-chief of Iran Namaz, a bilingual quarterly of uh, Iranian studies. He has also served previously as president for the Association of Iranian Studies. His areas of specialization are Middle Eastern history, modernity, and nationalism. And last but not least, I want to uh, introduce you to our moderator tonight, my colleague, uh, Beruz Moazami. He is the Patrick G. O'Keefe Distinguished Professor of History here at Loyola. He is also the founder and director of, Middle, of the Middle East Peace Studies Program. And uh, he joined our department in 2007. And I'm proud to say I was on the committee that had the good sense to hire him. Uh, and he initiated something that is really important to this community, our annual stu uh, university student peace conference that began in 2008 and is still going strong. And we will have, we have a call for papers out at El here on the screen every, every now and then during this presentation. And students especially, I encourage you to, uh, adhere, to adhere, adhere to that call for papers and send in some proposals. Uh, Dr. Mozami, um, 
also has two doctoral degrees, as if one isn't enough for anyone. Uh, he got a degree in political science in France and another in sociology and historical studies from the New School for Social Research here in the United States. For nearly two decades before joining academia, uh, Beruz was a professional political activist he con and contributed to a number of Iranian dissident publications. I want to acknowledge some important sponsors. Without his generosity, uh, tonight's event would not have been possible. Uh, Loyola University has funded the event through the Jerusalem Funds for Peace, uh, the, the Department of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and, and its, its steering committee, as well as the Patrick G. O'Keefe Distinguished Professorship Endowment. We're grateful for the support of the following groups. The Cedars Heritage Club of Baton Rouge, uh, the Rotary USA France Intercountry Committee, uh, its USA section, Bart Clear President Bart Cleary, and its French section, President Jean-Marie Poinsard. We are also grateful to Bibelot's Restaurant, who will be catering a reception tonight after our round table. That will be held in the Die Bowl Gallery just across the way on the fourth floor of the Monroe Library. Uh, if you're a visitor, just follow the hungry folks uh, over there when the uh, round table is begun. And I'm going to step down now and let uh, Beruz lead our panel uh, and our discussion with our distinguished guests. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Mark. Many, can you hear me all? Yes, many thanks, Mark. Uh, let me say a little bit about the discrepancy between the poster that you have seen and the list of the invited guests here. Uh, one reason of it is that several development had happened that we could not have them all here. Uh, for example, Professor Turgul was supposed to be here, but uh, he was kept at the airport. Well, he came for the only for this, for this panel from China, but he was kept at the airport and did not let him to come in for one hour. And then he lost his flight, so he's now in, in Detroit and is talking to us from Detroit. Thanks a lot, Torgol, for joining us. Thank uh, you very much. Professor Landis was supposed to be here, but something urgent happened. He couldn't make it. We, last minute, we got to ask Professor Azam, and I'm so glad that he's here because he's not only a very valuable academic, he's also a voice of dissident in Syria, and we would like to hear his voice as well. So many thanks for that, and sorry for, uh, for that delay. What it is, uh, I had sent some questions to everybody. They had the questions. I'm going to read my questions first, and with this question, we'll start the debate. And after that, uh, well, I'll explain what we're going to do, and you'll see. And I'll ask you all to, in, to, to take part in the discussion. Let me start with a very short introduction. The Middle East is on the verge of another epochal transformation. Current domestic dynamic coupled with regional and international intrigues point to a new phase to what could be another act of an absurd drama. Could we envision a better future or a chance of worsening the situation is more likely than a progressive outcome? Is it not what's going, to, what, is it not what's going on in Lebanon and Iraq promises a sort of hope? or as one of our students rightly is a mixture of hope and ambiguity. Claire had, has, is writing a paper on that. Nevertheless, I believe that the hope and wisdom have moral force, and so I would suggest that this might be a fortunate moment to ponder collectively the future of peace and democracy in the Middle East. Let me say the importance of this debate. There are 1,403 papers that are being presented at the MESA conference, there is no panel as such in the press conference, despite the importance of the debate. There is only one panel that discusses the question of democracy. So you could, know, you could feel what the importance of this debate might be. I can hardly think of a better group for this task than the group here today. By that, I include not only the panelists, but also all of you in the audience, especially our lovely students who are, better, who are hope for the future. I'm, cons I'm convinced that we have the talent and the commitment here today to bring insight and understanding to the problem of Middle East. It is our goal to think collectively and compassionately with the firm com deep conviction that peace and democracy are obtainable. Uh, I really feel that's an important element that we have to bring that hope and zeal to our understanding. With the MESA, Middle East Scholars Association, holding its 
53rd annual meeting in town was an opportunity we could not miss. Indeed, in October 2013, we explored the same logic when the Middle East, the same topic when the Middle East Studies Association had this 47th annual meeting in NOLA. We were in the oldest building, uh, oldest uh, reincarnation of this building. It looks much nicer. Yes, now, yes, yes. He was there also. I'll start a debate with two series of questions. The first political and the second more conceptual. I have, I have asked the three of our guests, Professor Azem, Keskin, and Tawakul Taraki, to address these questions from the perspective of their own expertise in more than eight minutes. They each have received my questions in advance. Ustaz Nadim Shahadi will comment and ask follow-up question. Again, no more than eight minutes. He will be the official devil advocate of the round table. He's incredibly <coughs> good at it. He's the best. Trust me. Oh, wow. Each of our esteemed guests will be asked to answer Nadim's questions and comments in no more than four minutes and to sum up their positions. I myself will discuss briefly why, why I believe that the existing peace efforts have failed. If any of the participant, participants propose a solution for the future of peace and democracy in the Middle East, we will use four minutes for the discussion of the proposal. In fact, I already have something to propose myself. It's not my only proposition. We made it with Father Gerlich who is sitting up there. As the, time, as the time monitor, I will strictly enforce the time rules throughout the discussion. We will, we will end the discussion with question and answer <coughs> from our audience before going to our receptions. <coughs> now, these are my questions, political question. How would you characterize the ongoing tension in the Middle East? How would you see the every recent popular struggle in Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, to a much lesser extent Iran, in shaping the different Middle East? Yes, if you have it. Beautiful, thanks. Are we, are, are we moving in any way closer to, run, to a sustainable peace process and democratic start? No, no, just a second, just. <coughs> I start from the beginning, I'm so sorry. How would you characterize the ongoing tension in the Middle East? How do you see the very recent popular struggle in Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt, and to much lesser extent in Iran, in shaping a different Middle East? Are we moving in any way closer to a sustainable peace process and democratic order, or we are distancing ourselves? Is there any hope for peace and democracy in the Middle East? How? Are we dealing with the Middle Eastern problem, having roots in local and regional and geopolitical or we are dealing with much more complex and universal phenomena. We are witnessing a shift from the world domination by the United States and its European allies to a world order dominated by China. By, provide, by, by, by providing towards Asia since the 19th century revolution, Iran has been the forefront of this regional accord. These are your answers, right? Oops, don't read that. Yeah, yeah, oh. sorry, sorry. So I haven't seen the answers. No, That's you don't one. have to see the answers. You have to make it up yourself. <laughs> Conceptual question. So, sorry, it's a bit, uh, I don't know what happened. Why does the existing literature on peace and democracy treat those arguably social construct, peace and democracy, as two separate domains of political and social inquiries? Could we define democracy in its simplest definition as a representation of popular sovereignty and peace as a lack of armed conflicts or minimum <coughs> conflicts? If these two concept construct are, if these two conceptual constructs are socially and logically interconnected, why these are rarely linked in such a, other in the scholarly inquiries or political discourse? I went through all the. Uh, writings on, the, on this subject, almost all the writings on this subject. And I have not seen anywhere a coherent 
argument that peace and democracy, <coughs> despite the fact that it's very logical how they are connected to each other. I have not been able to find it anywhere. Why? Obviously, it's most, where particularly in the Middle East that we need it the most. Does this conceptual ambiguity have anything to do with the formation of Westphalia Peace Treaty and impact of the Westphalia state system of social sciences and history? Has this process <coughs> and focus convinced our theoretical imagination? Is this oversight to some degree related to the overstated extrapolation of the notion of Westphalian sover sovereignty over the right of ordinary people? Were not we forced to think of democracy as an internal issue belonging to the state domestic affairs and war and peace as mostly an external affair where the sovereign state prefers to defend certain national interests or territorial integrity? The state enter, enter to the war because of those two elements mostly. If we are not able to concede that this division of labor between domestic and international, foreign and external, are a part of the nation, national state making process, could we apply it to the United States, to the Middle East and how the, how the nation states were formed? The ongoing Middle Eastern conflict are multi layered, and for that reason, it's difficult to offer a single and straightforward analysis of the causes and goals that underpin these varied and but interconnected worlds. Yet this complexity and sheer size of the human tragedy and the inability of the so-called international community to impose, a, with, to, to impose a solution for us to extend our imagination beyond the realm of the real politics and to consider a solution beyond the existing framework. We need to go beyond the existing dilemma <coughs> to come to some sort of a solution. With this short remarks, I ask our inv invited guests to, pop to ponder on these uh, above questions. Above questions, uh, and that's it. We start with Ustaz Amar al-Azim, because we go by alphabetical order. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, here tonight. And I'm, you know, you ask a tall order with your uh, questions. And so I'm going to approach this from a personal narrative, I think, and a personal experience, and perhaps attempt to kind of reflect on the, the main points that you raised there. Uh, when the uh, uprising in Syria began in 2011, um, I was here in the, in the US, and uh, very quickly, uh, colleagues and friends in, in DC were, would start started to call and contact myself and colleagues like myself to ask us what is going on and 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 you know what do you think about the events that were happening in Syria? And uh, one of the questions that was repeatedly asked is, uh, what was your vision? What vision do you have for? You know, we're talking about in in, in very kind of concepts. We're talking very general concepts. Oh, we want democracy. We want freedom, we want uh, basic rights, and so on and so forth. But articulating that, shaping that into a, a, a some sort of coherent message that would resonate uh, in, 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 in D.C. Or, or even let alone speak to people on the streets or the, our, our friends, family members, uh, fellow Syrians, seemed a, a little uh, distant. And in the end, uh, that's, uh, and, uh, uh, this is how the TDA, the day after, uh, came to be. It came to be as an idea of a possible vision to promote a democratic uh, transition in Syria centered around a number of core uh, areas, if you will, which included, this is how we envisioned it. This was our kind of model or idealism, if you will, that, you know, a, a, a democratic transition in, in a place like Syria would need to look at rule of law, transitional justice, justice, security sector reform, electoral reform, constitutional design, 
economic, perhaps social reforms. And we thought once we had all this together, this would somehow magically kind of materialize and, and address uh, all the issues. But as we found out and others found out, and as the region continues to uh, evolve in the way it does with the, the latest events, again, that we're seeing in Iraq, in Lebanon, and elsewhere, it's a much more complicated uh, story. It's a much more complicated process. And one aspect uh, that became clear to me quite early on in terms of the challenges we faced in doing that were in part caused by this uh, clash. So, so beyond the, the you know, uh, traditional regional rivalries and uh, hegemonic interests of the regional actors, but more at, on the ground level, it was more seemed to me like there was a clash of identities going on there, ethnic identities, social identities, sectarian ideological these super identities that constantly seem to be pervaded time and time again over any sort of logical construct that I thought would immediately somehow come together. And for me, it came out of an understanding and a realization that this is more to do with the fact that in the absence of a have a strong sense of national identity. And these other super identities that had long been used by regimes or been uh, allowed to, be, to play a prominent role seem to be overtaking events and, and allowing them to, 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 to dominate. So in the end, you end up with these binaries of either Assad or Daesh, either, uh, you know, Sunni domination or Shiite domination, either uh, extremists, uh, you know, extreme religiosity or extreme secularism. All these these binaries seem to uh, constantly be played out, and in the end, you're given this answer of, of peace. If there's going to be peace, then it's essentially a, the only way you can have peace is at the expense of democracy. So whether you want social peace or civil peace or actually even physical peace, uh, it's, it, it has to somehow come at the expense of democracy. So uh, looking at the most recent events that are happening now, I think there is maybe perhaps a realization uh, amongst certainly uh, the protesters in Lebanon, the protesters in Iraq, when you listen to their uh, most recent chants, when you listen to uh, their demands beyond the, the, the obvious, their, 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 their economic, uh, you know, the, the fact that economic aspirations have not been fulfilled, their anti-corruption, there also seems to be some recognition that perhaps they need to look beyond those immediate super identities that have controlled so many of, of the narratives around them. And uh, so I, I think I'm kind of hopeful. I'd like to feel hopeful that, unlike perhaps what we saw happening in 2011, uh, that very much represented wasted opportunities and, and for reasons well known and understood now by most of us, uh, maybe this new wave that is emerging will have a, a, a chance, an opportunity by learning from the mistakes that we made in 2011 and maybe being able to uh, sort of uh, supersede those, if you will. Um, but I think also the forces acting against them are extremely powerful and, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the challenge is great and we'll see what happens. I think these are just my basic reflections right now. We go next to Professor Keskin, please, and then we come to um, Mr. Tavakoli Tar 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 You know, um, Behrouz, thank you very much for inviting me. Sorry to, you know, not be able to be there. Uh, actually, you know, the, I have been traveling last one month to different places, including the Qatar, Turkey, Italy, then finally the United States. Um, um, it's interesting how we are, how we characterize you know the, uh, the the certain transformation in the Middle East. It's a very interesting concept, especially related to democracy. 
Um, uh, I am more pessimistic, basically, in the, in the Middle East, especially recent transformation in the Middle East, uh, especially in, in the context of you know, what's happening in, in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Afghanistan, if you consider the Afghanistan and Pakistan as the Middle East, you know, Libya, uh, and including the Algeria since the 1990s, um, and Tunisia in 2011. Um, I mean, since the, you know, the Cold War started in the 1950s, we see the you know, turmoil in the Middle East, actually. Uh, and since 1949, U.S. involvement in the Middle East, uh, in general, in the, around the world, um, uh, uh, U.S. supported military coup, uh, interfering the elections. Uh, almost 39 of them in, in the, in the, around the world basically took place. This is another destabilization in the Middle East we have seen last almost 70 years. In Turkey, United States got involved in three different military coups. One is the last attempted coup in 2016. Uh, in Iran in 1953 is another one basically. Under these circumstances, how can we have a democracy? How can we create a middle class? How can we create a you know, the stable economy? What is the foundation of the democracy in the Middle East or around the world, basically? Um, and you know, uh, in last 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 two decades, we have seen the you know the emerging new power, global power, China. Um, maybe you know that this U.S. involvement in the Middle East is directly related to China, especially the last two decades. Um, uh, I mean, you know, um, <coughs> this is this is some of the you know, my concern basically and my. Uh, my my views, um, but uh, I mean after the occupation of the Iraq, in in, in, in you know almost 1.2 million people were killed in Iraq. I'm not defending the Saddam, but under the Saddam, when we look at the Iraq, there was at least security for the ordinary individual, healthcare for the ordinary individual, education for the ordinary individual. But today Iraq was scrambled basically. Same thing is happening in Syria <coughs> today. Same thing happened in Libya, same thing happening in Lebanon, same thing, beautiful country in the southern part of the Arabia, basically, Yemen, was destroyed. Afghanistan today was sent to the Stone Age, Stone Age. I mean, how can we have a democracy under the circumstances? How can we have a peace under the circumstances? I mean, you know, uh, if you look at this, next few decades in the Middle East, have been lost from my own perspective. There will be no democracy, there will be no peace, of course. The reason is there is no stable economy. Democracy comes from the middle class with the market, economy, and emergence of the modern educational system, emergence of the urbanization, emergence of the, you know, the development of the education system, healthcare, uh, but we don't see this kind of things and concepts in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya, in near future. Maybe it's not going to be the, you know, the same thing in Lebanon and Jordan. Look at what's happening in Saudi Arabia. And on the other hand, when we look at you know, the US uh, sanction on Iraq, Iran, will create another unintended consequence in the Middle East. When we look at the Pakistan, on the other hand, closer to Middle East, is not in the Middle East. Almost 180 million people living in, in Pakistan. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm not sure how many people have been in Pakistan recently, but I have been in Pakistan, you know, I did my dissertation on Pakistan, Jamaat Islami. I mean, Pakistan has been devastated since 1979 because of the next door uh, war in, in Afghanistan. And I am not sure the U.S. war in Afghanistan is directly related with Taliban or might be related with China, containment of the China, actually, which is another issue, that democracy issue, that we see today in Hong Kong, actually, in Hong Kong, so-called democracy movement in Hong Kong, you know, killing and destroying the, you know, the public properties, killing the people, actually. What democracy are we talking about here? Who's going to bring the democracy? From the outside, or democracy comes from the grassroots and inside, and with the development of the economy. So, uh, therefore, I'm a little bit more pessimistic about you know the democracy and peace in the Middle East under these current circumstances 
and outside interference in the Middle East, which I will call this the imperialism, basically. New imperialism, according to Neil Smith, or according to David Harvey, that we need to face this imperialism in the Middle East, unfortunately, sooner or later. Thank you very much. Professor Tarri Tabako. Hello, everyone. Uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mazani, for uh, organizing uh, this distinguished panel with colleagues. I have the honor of uh, being with them on the panel. And uh, also, colleague, uh, history department and other institutions at Loyola who have sponsored important event. I'm going to take a little bit different take on this. I have a different take. I have been in the past couple of year, years working on a project that is called pathologizing Iran. It starts from late 19th century and the prominent advancement of a medical political discourse. So I have been working on early modern Iran, late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, 21st century is out of my reach, but I'm going to give it a try. While peace and democracy continue to provide the rhetoric and the horizon of expectations for social movements in the Middle East, our age is not an age of democratization. We live in an era of individuated surveillance and securitization. Handheld and wired devices purchased by users all over the world while simplifying and extending their social contacts serve as mobile Panopticons. You know what panopticons are? These are sort of inside prisons looking at how prisoners are working. So our hand handheld devices serve as mobile panopticons for sustained and undisrupted state and corp corporate surveillance. Twitter sought the credit for the green movement in Iran. Facebook marketed itself as the harbinger of the Arab Spring and Telegram for the latest season of uprisings in Iran. As wired panopticons of information gathering and surveillance, could these very corporations and their powerful networking tools also be held responsible for the containment and defeat of these democratic movements. While strengthening the state's ability for detailed and sustained surveillance of their respective citizens, wired citizens are also able to fundamentally challenge the Westphalian model of sovereignty with the highly profitable micro-targeting of tastes, desires, and political aspirations and ideologies, the digital fragmentation of the social parallels the proxy wars on the ground in Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, and Libya. In the same way that the market, that micro-targeting is the great source of revenue for the high-tech companies, the continued political crisis particularly in Iran, has served as an unprecedented source of revenue for the Saudi state. This is one thing that no one really takes into account. 
with the weaponization of international economic inter interdependence, the United States intensifying economic sanction on Iran has enabled the Saudis to be the primary financial beneficiaries of the political crisis that started with the 1979 Iranian revolution and intensified with the Iran-Iraq war, the war that disabled another petro rival of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi revenues sharply increased with the US invasion of Iraq and reached new heights in the aftermath of Arab Spring and the destruction of Libyan petro infrastructure. Conversely, however, the sectarianization of Iraq and Syria by the United States, like the earlier French political sectarianization of Lebanon, has strengthened the Iranian political leverage on countries with sizable Shi'i population. Both Saudi Arabia and Iran, however, face formidable internal impasses. While the Saudis are financially benefiting from the dismemberment of their petrol rivals, the continued political crisis in the Middle East is deeply fracturing the Saudi political elite, who must deal with their own politicized and radicalized population. While politically benefiting from the sectarianization of Arab politics, Iranian state is suffering from a chronic economic crisis. The Iranian policy of import substitution and pivot to Asia, while reducing the impact of the US sanctions on the Iranian economy, it has, however, led to the de-Americanization and rapid sinicization, Chinaization of Iran's economic infrastructure. All the things inside Iran, industrial complexes that one time were run by Americans or by, by Europeans now are operated by Chinese engineers and by Chinese high-tech companies. The intensifying, tr this intensifying thread, trend has over-determined the political impasse between the Iranian hardliners and Iranian reformers. Hardli hardliners, Iranian hardliners, who are anti-American, anti-Western, are closely allied to the Iranian industri industrial establishment that is linked to China. With the digital micro-targeting and intensified proxy wars. Are we to abandon the dream of democratization and peaceful coexistence in the Middle East? This is the key question that Professor Mazami has asked. Do these developments signal the end of a state sovereignty as we know it? The ongoing Lebanese and Iraqi popular protests seem to signify a shift to a more inclusionary and accommodating conception of the national polity. The rejection of sectarian politics by demonstrators in Iraq and Lebanon, if genuine and sustained, could offer new prospects for the crisis-ridden written states in the Middle East. Here, I'm informed by Ernesto Leclau, uh, a political theorist, a prominent Marxist political theorist, who distinguished between political discourse of equivalence, where us, them, and 
and, uh, and, and uh, Arabs against Iranians, Shis against Sunnis, this supra kind of ideological and political identities to a discourse of difference where instead of assuming that the nation has a singular identity and marginalizing and othering all other ethnic or national groups is to engage with them and make them part of the nation. That is, in a sense, a proliferation of identities rather than constituting a single identity. I see what is happening with the rejection um, of, uh, of sectarianism in Iraq and in, uh, in Lebanon, the beginning of the emergence of what we may call a populist discourse of difference, the people come together without the negating their ethnic or religious differences. Instead of a uniform and undifferentiated conception of Arab, Sunni, Shi'i, and Christian identities, with the new technological and political realities, like what is happening in Iraq and Lebanon, other Middle Eastern societies and states could be also compelled to adopt a more inclusionary conception of the national and social identities. In a sense, this intensification of proxy warfares and with the development of this mobile panopticons that we have and, and um, micro-targeting of tastes and political ideologies, the, Iran, the, the Middle Eastern states are forced, compelled to think differently. This would be the only way to reduce the negative impact of proxy forces, both digital and underground in the, in, in the national political processes. The unholy alliance of Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and Syria to safeguard each other's territorial integrity could only work if it is likewise accompanied with accommodationist political discourses that are inclusive of Kurdish, Yazidi, and other ethnic and religious identity. Such a project could be strengthened if it is also accompanied by an economic union that allows the Kurds and other marginalized borderland communities to materially benefit from the interstate commerce between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. Such developments could compel the Persian Gulf Arab monarchies to develop a more flexible, participatory, and accommodationist political institutions. Without such inclusionary institutions, the monarchies, which have been the financial beneficiaries of political upheaval will be the casualties of an emerging political order in the Middle East. Let me draw your attention to a parallel development in Iran in the decade immediately after the 1979 revolution. With the emergence of, the sat of satellite technology, VCR, and camcorders, the revolutionary government that had invested heavily in movie theaters and high budget pro propaganda movies, faced a formidable competition from video technology that people could produce films and things in uh, themselves and then distributed uh, for home use. Instead of going to move movie theaters, they uh, showed films at home to protect the state's investment in film industry, from 1983, the Iranian state banned the home video technology. Instead of destruction, however, the ban contributed 
to the rapid underground growth and prosperity of home videos and amateur film production. And much of the growth of Iranian cinema and its fame internationally is product of this really intense and interesting tension. Threatened by a thriving underground video cultural economy in 1994, the Iranian state removed the ban and thus was able to bring this new technology under its own watchful eyes. So the technology creates new possibilities. If you try to crush it, it crushes you. To be able to control it, you have to accommodate it. The same is true also with, the, uh, with, with wired technology that in, my, in the way I see it is very similar to the barb wired and walled prison because we increasingly are withdrawing from the public. And you go to sites of public interactions and people are sitting there and uh, doing Google search. <laughs> As a more powerful rival, the wire technology and its parasocial media, that is highly fragmented social, give the petro-states more effective means of surveillance, and thus it would not be possible to survive without it. But to use it as a mobile panopticon, with immense power of surveillance, like their counterparts all over the world, the Middle Eastern states must be compelled or will be compelled to accept the diversity of taste, style, political aspiration, and religious convictions. With resemblances to pre-nation state communities in the Middle East, that was referred to as mosaic society at one time, remember? An inclusionary and accommodationist populist discourse of difference that accommodates the, that accommodates the digital micro-targeting would be the only savior for the crisis-ridden Middle Eastern states from the debilitating proxy wars. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's Professor Shahidi. <coughs> you must be joking. You want me to answer all of this? Yes. All of this? I need eight minutes. I need half an hour to answer him alone. But <laughs> A second. <laughs> so, yes. if I have to answer everything in eight, eight minutes. minutes my comments will have to be nasty, brutish, and short. That's, we like that. that that's, like that. <laughs> that's, my, that's what my, we want you here. So, uh, um, yes, I mean, you want me to be the devil's advocate, but yeah. you also want me to be the devil, too. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, Comrade Behrut, uh, demo peace and democracy are both very nice, positively loaded words. And you have to be very careful about positively loaded words. So you have the 20th century is the century of positively loaded words like uh, freedom, equality, democ democracy, uh, cohesiveness, uh, uh, homogeneity. Uh, and I think the worst possible crimes have been committed in, in, in their name. And they're, and they're not all necessarily compatible. Just because they're positively, they sound positive, doesn't mean that that freedom is compatible with equality. Sometimes, sometimes you have to sacrifice freedom for equality. Sometimes you have to sacrifice peace uh, for democracy. And sometimes you have to sacrifice democracy for peace. And and I think. Um, um, Hope and ambiguity is a very good description. So we are in a, I mean, in the United States, the, the best illustration of this was something that was very much praised, which is the Obama speech in Cairo. 
Obama's speech, Obama's speech in Cairo, first of all, addressed the Muslim world. He did not address the people. He addressed, he considered us all part of something called the Muslim world, which means that he mentally has accepted the division between the Muslim world and the rest of the world. So that makes him a Salafi fundamentalist. But more seriously, in, in, in your, uh, for your purpose, he spoke about democracy in the end, he said, and he apologized for it. In the end of his speech, <clears throat> he was addressing the dictators of the region and telling them not to worry, because the United States loves democracy, loves freedom and all that, but we will not impose it on people. So he was kind of, in a way, reassuring them that he is not George Bush and he will not try and democratize. <laughs> so democratization became a dirty word after G.W. Bush, and I'm going to try and rehabilitate it. Because it is a common theme between the three. Between the, the, the three. So if I'm going to be nasty, brutish, and short, I will have to address the, the, common, the common to theme. all of us. Yes, to all of you. Uh, but but uh, you, you, I mean, I'm being unfair because your presentations were so brilliant that they deserve uh, uh, much more uh, discussion and by people more competent than than than, than, than me. So I want to to uh, so um, so f um, first of all to Amr, my my friend. Hi, Kifak. Um, you see, you are trapped in a 20th century model <coughs> that considers that people have to be in a democracy, that people have to be, in, in a way, uniform, that the national identity is in contradiction with local identities, with religion, with ethnicities, and with, and with uh, regionalism and all that. So in a way, you are, you are trying to fight the bath with its own ideas. You are, there, there is a little Bashar in every single one of us, and the little Bashar in you is still sticking to a national homogeneous identity and thinks that diversity is, is, uh, is, 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 is not a, uh, is not, is not, um, is not desirable on, on um, um, I will skip Westphalia. It's a big, 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 big thing. No, uh, Professor Keskin, thank you so much for illustrating one of my very uh, controversial points, <coughs> which is about the, the Iraq war. Um, so I think that <clears throat> I'm not as, as pessimistic as you are about the region because I have a different narrative and a different interpretation of, of the Iraq war. I think the Iraq war the, needs to be re-examined, especially the lessons of the Iraq war needs to be re-examined because the lessons of the Iraq war got, brought us something much worse than what happened in, after the Iraq invasion. It brought us Syria. So the United States, instead of, because it's trapped in this narrative that the Iraq war was a disaster, uh, tried, in order to try to prevent another Iraq, bro uh, caused Syria, which is far more disastrous than Iraq, and, and destabilized the, the whole region. Iraq, Turkey, Lebanon, uh, even Europe, is the, the rise of the, the populist movements in Europe are in, uh, in reaction to waves of uh, refugees coming from the region is is partly due to uh, trying to prevent another 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 Iraq and uh, so so uh, i'm I'm not so so pessimistic uh, as 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 you are because I think the unintended consequences could be positive the unintended consequences of the Iraq invasion which was a mistake, which was a disaster, that's not a problem, but the unintended consequences was that the fall of the statue of Saddam Hussein demystified the power of dictatorship in the region and caused a, you know, it was the flap of a butterfly's wing that brought us to, to where we are today through 
uh, first of all, dictators in the region and all the regimes trying to, to look pretty and pretending to be democratization, democratizing and, and modernizing, you know, from Bashar al-Assad and his lovely wife to, uh, to all the others uh, who were trying to, to show. This was, this was, in a way, they were trying to show that they, they, should, they, they are uh, democratizing, but they were not. And they, they tried to fool the world and they did. If you look at uh, the uh, reports from international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and the OECD and the EU and all that about uh, the region, which is something I had to do in 2009-2010, uh, the, 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 the highest marks went to Egypt, then to Syria, then, then to uh, uh, Libya was got very good marks because it was uh, sort of in the right direction, and Tunis was perfect, of course, with Ben Ali, and uh, the, the 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 failed states of the region were Iraq and Lebanon. So, so just the the night before the population of the region rose against their dictators, the world gave them full full marks <laughs> on on that. So there's something wrong with the way we think, not. With, and, and in a way, uh, some, something like the Syrian revolution is not only trying to fight Bashar al-Assad, it is also trying to fight the whole body of, of uh, uh, 20th century I, I, ideas uh, that are incorporated in a system like Bashar al-Assad. So uh, if, you, if you analyze, if you sort of... Uh, think of what, what these are. Uh, and here, I mean, I will, I will generalize because Iraq is the same. Iraq, uh, Iraq uh, uh, the, the system in Iraq and Syria and in Egypt and all that were, were similar. They were all based on uh, variations of Kemalism or variations of sort of homogenizing nationalist ideologies uh, that, that uh, that that wanted to 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 create to abolish these these differences. So you have these. If you want to make it summarize it, there is a, there is a you have these identities and these religions that were like a spring here. There's a spring. There was a spring here. The spring the spring was being suppressed for over a hundred years. You're it's you're not allowed to have religious parties or ethnic parties or regional parties or whatever, you have to all be part of the same homogeneous identity. So they, the spring, the more you press on a spring, the higher it will, it will jump. And, and so th in, the, in the Arab Spring, this is the Arab, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is reacting against this uh, phenomenon, which is a very 20th century phenomenon, which is the creation of homogeneous uh, and, and uh, cohesive societies with the same identity, with the same, with the same uh, 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 kind of, uh, e with equality, with, with equality also. So, so, so it's, it's, um, um, so, so, um, so the revolts now in Iraq, in Lebanon, and in Iran, there are revolts in Iran as we speak uh, now, are unintended consequences also of the Iraq, of the Iraq war. And um, I think they are a positive uh, uh, unintended co consequence. For me, Iran is an occupied country. It's occupied by a, by a gang called the Revolutionary Guards who are unelected, <laughs> you know, they are, and, and who, who dictate who is elected and who is not. They control the economy, they control the prisons, they control, they, 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 obs they uh, suppress the population, they've created uh, agents uh, and proxy uh, they've, uh, uh, organizations in Lebanon, in Syria, in, in Iraq, and everybody's rebelling against, against, uh, against this. So I, I am optimistic uh, about the rebellions and and I'm optimistic for Iran, I'm optimistic for uh, Iraq and for Lebanon. And I don't think... And for Saudi Arabia too? Uh, well, 
for Saudi Arabia, I'm, I was never op optimistic about Saudi Arabia, but I think your interpretation of the Saudi system or, or the, the, the Gulf states, because you did not just mention, you said the whole Gulf, Gulf monarchies, um, has, well, has uh, I mean, if I want to be, uh, to criticize it, I mean, they, I think they are very, they, they have created societies where, which are very diverse and, and, and uh, very tolerant, because if you think... How it is have? No, uh, the Gulf states, I mean, the, the UAE and Qatar and all these countries, they have a population, of, with, they have, the, the indigenous population is about 10, 12% of the, of the general population. And so they, they have managed to absorb 10 times their population and managed to create a society which is, which is, which is tolerant. In a, as in, guest in, workers in a, in a, with as no a, rights, as no guest political workers with, rights, nothing. Yes, I think, I think... And that's inclusionary. That's, I think that they have opened their, their land to... I think this is preferable... To guest workers. This is, yeah, this is preferable to me than a European system that will collapse if 1% of its population come as immigrants. You know, the European system has collapsed, uh, uh, is collapsing, or uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, uh, at least it's in a, in a huge crisis. Uh, and uh, this country has elected Donald Trump because of xenophobia from a, a, a very small proportion of its population. So uh, in Lebanon, we have uh, a third of, our po of the population are refugees. They are not treated equally. They are discriminated against, but they, th we have accepted them. Uh, so, 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 uh, and, and they live there. <laughs> you know, they, they, it's, it's better than being held at an airport for an hour, uh, you know, or, or being returned uh, then. So, so I think one has to, to re revise these, these uh, uh, generalizations. And depending on what we think is the, the consequence that is unintended and unknown, I don't know what is going to emerge from the current upheavals in the region. Um, but I know that it will be different from uh, what we had before. And I do not ide idealize the 20th century state, nor the 20th century ideas that are based, that are, that are, uh, um, uh, uh, that a lot of our, uh, I have to be very careful now because I'll never be invited again here. But, uh, but you see, um, before the 20th century, the biggest mathematicians, there, there, let's be put it this way, there was very little difference in people's minds, uh, in the minds of Descartes and Newton and Galileo and all these people, between mathematics, philosophy, and theology. Now we have departments which consider that economics is a science and it's different from political science and it's different from sociology, uh, you see, so, 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 and and this kind of scientism of the 20th century um, has, in a way, fragmented our our minds to 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 many to many uh, um, sort of to to see the to, uh, to inability to see, a, let's say, a larger a larger picture, and uh, to conclude, Westphalia divided the world into. Um, into uh, homogeneous uh, states in, in Europe, into homogeneous entities, uh, principalities, which in the end came, became the, the, the homogeneous nation state in, 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 in Europe. In our region, um, um, we are used to more diversity and, and we accept more, more diversity. And I think it is a, bet a much better ideal so a <laughs> cosmopolitan uh, 19th century type uh, society for me is is far um, is i'm much more comfortable with it than than uh, the, the current uh, so i think i've uh, stuck my neck out enough 
for the, to create uh, some. Is this? Will I be? Will yes. I, yes, uh, yes. Do I get dessert after mm, dinner? Yes. yes. That? <laughs> and you will be invited again. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, will I start the uh, same way we started by answering the questions and building up upon the discussions? We start with you, Professor Azam. Okay. Um, so, Nadim, thank you very much for taking your scalpel to my uh, minor contribution, but I feel like I went in for an appendix and came out without a gallbladder. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And the reason for that is that I, I think you, maybe I didn't articulate it well enough, so perhaps I indicated the, the pain in the wrong place, but uh, so maybe I should explain a little. Yeah. Um, when I talk about uh, national identity, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm trying to say, what makes a Syrian, this is a question we ask ourselves, what makes a Syrian a Syrian today? Well, how do I identify my Syrianness? What is it going to be based on? And... Um, <clears throat> You know, the, for, for me, a national identity is going to be based on a shared common history that all Syrians share. Um, so it doesn't matter whether you come, you're an ally from the coast or you're from the tribes in Deir Zor or you're from the south, uh, from Dera. Every Syrian knows that Queen Zenobia and identifies with who Queen, Queen Zenobia is and what she represents for them. Every Syrian knows that Ugarit was the birthplace of the first uh, cuneiform alphabet. So that shared common history, I think, uh, 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 and along with side that shared common history are going to be shared common aspirations. They may be economic, they may be private, they may be public, but at the end of the day, it, it represents the glue that's going to hold that society together. And in the case of Syria, at least, this, the very weakness of this uh, common identity, the shared, the, the shared, the shared components, uh, meant that as soon as the Arab, you know, the, the uprising started in Syria, because of the neglect of successive regimes, governments, etc., this identity was always bypassed, always superseded by uh, super identities that are ethnic, social, sectarian, uh, regional, whatever. It meant that as soon as the uh, uh, Syria began to go, undergo an extreme form of stress, it just came apart. The, the glue just kind of dissolved, disintegrated, and Syria fractured across every single cleavage that is represented by those super identities, whether it's uh, religious, whether it's sectarian, whether it's economic, whether it's uh, political, etc. So uh, for me, the argument I was trying to make is that I, we learned this, I realized this as we kind of went around trying to put our TBA together and wondering why, you know, something as basic and as, you know, structured as, you know, you have five core elements, what was missing? And in my realization, the, the, this common shared glue was what was missing. And so when I look at what is happening today in Lebanon and Iraq, uh, the protesters in Iraq and Lebanon are in a way unified be, by their common aspirations. Um, and they are putting those aspirations over the traditional super identities that they have. Whether, you know, so, so I mean, the big question in Lebanon right now, the only chance of success is they over, overcome the, 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 the confessionalism. As long as they insist that the prime minister must be Sunni and the president must be Maronite, and so on and so forth, then I don't think this will ever develop into anything more than uh, what we see on the streets today. The same with the Iraqis. Uh, as long as they maintain this uh, cohesiveness around these common shared aspirations in, in the, you know, anti-corruption, uh, uh, anti-Iranian intervention, etc., and they don't disintegrate or they don't revert back to their traditional, if you will, conflict lines, then again, perhaps they have a chance. Will they succeed? I don't know. The, the lure of these super identities is, is very powerful, and the fears that lurk within our societies are, are great. Um, so I, we wait and see, but I'd like to be a little optimistic. Anyway, that was the point I was trying to make um, in, in, in my argument. 
So perhaps I clarified it a bit. Anyway, thank you. Th that's exactly what I understood and what I don't agree with. You have to buy me a beer one day. <laughs> I am <mean>, ready. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, next time I'm up your end of the, uh, your neck of the woods, uh, okay. it's on me. Okay, now it's Professor Kreskin, please. Four minutes, not more than that. Oh, he's not on. I think one thing we are not clear, what the democracy is. How the democracy is flourished, developed, emerge. Under the circumstances, how do democracy flourish? Now, we are not talking about the NED style democracy imposed from the outside, National Endowment for Democracy established in 1983. This reminds me of the, another book actually, uh, Promoting Holyarchy, William Robinson from University of California, Santa Barbara. Actually, it's a very good book directly related to the democracy promotion in Latin America. I mean, you know, this is not a Chatham House or National Endowment for Democracy. We are talking about, you know, the non-existence middle class in the Middle East, not stable economy, and destabilization of the Middle East, and imposition of, the, you know, uh, a war coming from the outside, and we are talking about ethnic identities, how to bring them together, how to leave them in peacefully. This is not going to be, you know, uh, this is not going to be, you know, happen actually. Another one, uh, another important one um, uh, came to my mind uh, related to Syria. Um, if you haven't read the book, uh, when the Syrian crisis happened in 2011, right? In right after the 2011. Um, it's a very good book, Operation Center, Acts of War by Tom Clancy. If you haven't read that book, you should definitely read it. It was published in 1997. And this book explains the current situation in Syria and published almost 14 years ago. There are two more important articles published. Uh, uh, one is the Graham Fuller, I think everyone knows the Graham from here, published in the World Policy Journal in 1997, redrawing the world borders. Uh, and another one, uh, Let Iraq Collapse by Daniel Byman, published in 1996 just seven years before the uh, Iraq was occupied, actually. I mean, uh, I am not sure, uh, I am not sure under the circumstances, therefore I am pessimistic a little bit, uh, democracy and peace will develop in the Middle East. Uh, if you look at the Syrian war today, I'm not defending the, the, the Bashar al-Assad, but the, the, the situation in Syria did not start with it. Bashar al-Assad, or in Qaddafi's Libya. In Qaddafi's Libya, at least, there was a basic human security for the people if you don't criticize the regime, or if you don't criticize, you know, the Qaddafi. You can get, you know, the basic rights. For example, basic human rights means, you know, the social security, health care, uh, job for the ordinary individuals. Same thing happened in Syria. I mean, I mean, if you look at, you know, here, we criticize the dictatorship, but we don't criticize, you know, the, who supported the dictatorship for last half a century in the Middle East. Same thing happened in, in, in Saudi Arabia, actually. Today, Saudi Arabia, who has supported Saudi Arabia last 60, 70 years? Who supported, the, you know, uh, Iran, Saddam Hussein against the Iran from 1980 to 1987? I think we forget the basic elements of, the, you know, politics in the Middle East. Um, I mean, these are the one of the, you know, the some of the, you know, my, my observation basically. Therefore, I am a little bit more pessimistic. And since the, you know, the 2007 and 2008, United States doesn't need the oil from the Middle East. Why United States has a uh, military base in the Middle East? Why the United States has trained and support, you know, the Syrian so-called freedom fighters against the Assad regime? Why United States bombed, you know, the Libya? Why United States supporting the uh, Saudi Arabia against the Yemen? As long as this involvement from our side continues, I don't think we will see democracy and peace in the Middle East, and dictatorship will continue, actually. One dictatorship will follow the another dictatorship in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. Um, 
in my presentation, the basic argument that I have is that democracy is not a day, the day after project. Political revolutions of the earlier century, the 20th century, all promised to establish democracy the day after they overthrow the regime and they reproduce the tyranny, the dictatorship that was in place. I started with our mobile panopticon in order to offer a different ways of conceptualizing tolerance, coexistence, diversification of taste, and I think the kind of development that we are facing and the prospect for the future of the Middle East, we do not have to credit this to the unintended consequences of an ugly and um, illegal war in Iraq. Uh, US's invasion has created a mess and there is no way of apologizing for George Bush. But what I'm arguing, in a sense, is that the kind of fragmentation that we are seeing is the kind of fragmentation that we are seeing also in the United States. The kind of micro-targeting that is producing these exclusionary political ideals and taste and the kind of political intolerance that we have seen in the United States in the recent years, this is produced with a new digital technology that has become pervasive in the everyday life of people all over the world. I have argued that this fragmentation of taste, political ideologies, and, and, and preference, preferences in the Middle East reflects, concurs with proxy wars that are going on. And now, this is a challenge, both for political activists, for ideologue, and for the states in the Middle East. The proxy war will continue. Fragmentation of taste and ideologies and the style of living and things, because of our wired lives, will become much more intensified. The way to solve it is to accommodate difference, to, to recognize that you can be Syrian, but not be proud of the, the great civilization of Syria. Be an Iranian and not necessarily brag about ancient, great <laughs> history of Iran. We do not need to have these hegemonic ideologies that have sought to absorb and obliterate difference create a unified past. This doesn't mean that we don't need to have national histories, but I think there are ways of recounting Iranian history, Iraqi history, Syrian history, Lebanese history that doesn't reproduce an exclusionary, hyper, super, supra identity of pan-Arabism or pan-Islamism or pan and Shiism, there could be a lot of a space. And I think the, the Middle Eastern states are going to be compelled to move in that direction. I think the kind of reconfiguration of forces between Turkey initially supporting overthrow of, of Bashar al-Assad and now coming around in a different way, and Iran Iranian state of the pre-revolutionary period had two major enemies, Syria and Iraq. Now these two states have become close friends of Iranian state. And, and in a sense, the kind of configuration, the kind of alliance between Turkey, Iran, Syria, and, and Iraq, if 
pursued with not obliteration of the rights of Kurds, but by allowing it, including it in a kind of political arrangement that it, that it emerges. If it creates a kind of political and economic situation that with the Kurds, Yazidis, and other marginalized political identities, they prosper, the nation states can preserve their integrity. Otherwise, the fragmentation will continue, the, fragment, the kind of fragmentation that we have seen, uh, we had seen in, in Syria and in Libya, and we have seen also in Afghanistan, will, will continue. But the states and political activists, political ideologues, political theorists could be smarter and understand that we do not live in the age of super identities, singular identities. You have to be accommodating differences. And the digital technology is becoming increasingly more and more important in our everyday life. And the way the high tech companies make money is to differentiating our taste, differentiating our ideological belonging, differentiating and pl pluralizing our uh, convictions. And, and to survive, these states must face the, new, the challenges of our, our 21st century. The challenge of the 21st century is either fragmentation or a kind of smart tolerance. Let me say also something before we uh, go to a couple of minutes, uh, Professor Sh Shahidi had asked for, Sh Shahidi had asked for it. Uh, let me say a couple of things first and then we go to him. Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, several of the propositions that has been made, uh, but in a, perhaps in a different way. So I want to use that as a way to propose a different understanding of it. Uh, one is that that's why it started with the Westphalian state system. I think national state is coming to a crisis. Everybody is coming to a crisis. And this is not only a Middle Eastern development, but certainly in Middle East, national state is coming to the crisis because some of these national states were made up. They were, there, is, there was, no, there was no, nothing called Iraq before as a state. I mean, there are Iraqis, people were thinking that Iraq is an important element in history, but certainly we don't have a state with a frontier called Iraq. We don't have a state with frontier called Syria. We don't have a state with frontier called Lebanon. These were all made up after the 1940s, 1917 wars. So I think we're coming to an end to that crisis of 19th century, which started with, with that crisis of nation state that started with the Westphalian state system. Westphalian state system, I think, is not adaptable, at least to the Middle East. This is, if it's adaptable to Europe, I have doubts about it but certainly it's not adopted to the Middle East. And this is coming to an end of the crisis. Now, what we have to do is, shall we think in other terms about the future? I certainly think we do. And here, I go back to 19th century's ideals that we have to think about it. We have to transform the world in a better way for all human beings. So for that case, I would suggest that what we need is to have some sort of a moral values to put us in the discourse of our work. And peace and democracy are not rhetoric. They might be rhetoric for Netanyahu. They might be rhetoric for the United States. But they, can, they are not rhetoric for the people who are actually using it and actually fighting for it and actually need it for, for the most. So there's, this is not the rhetoric for the people in Iraq. It's not the rhetoric for people now in uh, Egypt, not the rhetoric for the people in uh, Lebanon and so forth. So what it is, we have to be able to articulate that voice. And for that voice, I think we have to first and foremost make it very simple. For me, uh, nothing is, uh, and it goes with your diversification project. It's nothing more important than the representations. Everybody has their, even a small group 
has a right to represent itself. We have to have, we have to give, give the voice of representation to people. And for democracy and for the peace, we should not think that everybody could live together very happily all the time and so forth. That's that's total dream. But what is possible is not to be violent, not to be fighting each other at any time, and bring some sort of a cooperation. And I think this is possible if our differences is recognized. And it's recognized in our discourse, in our dreams, in our work, in our, in our actions. Uh, and to see the different ways that we can cooperate. That's, that's if we could do that, that's not a dream, that's, that's a reality, and that's a part of our work that we should do. I'll stop here, then I have something to support, to propose for, to, for that meaning later on. Please. Uh, thank you, Beirut. I have something to propose too. Okay, sure. Okay, so. Uh, you go to a proposal. So, you don't have to answer everything. No, my, pro my proposal is basically that for those of you who still, I see that this, there's a Mac here who, who, who used PC before, we need to do control, alt, delete, and start from scratch and revise all these concepts uh, because we live in a complex system where the the end result is not the sum of what everybody wants in in, 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 the, in the end. Uh, there are arguments, I will not go into them, but there are cliches and arguments and the words we use are very revealing. When we call diversity fragmentation, it means in our mind we want unity is good and homogeneity is good. Fragmentation is bad. A fragmentation is a is a is a negatively loaded word. So we we call identities fragmentation as opposed to unity, which which is a positively loaded word. So we have to basically re-examine all these all the all these concepts, all these uh, preconceived ideas that we take for granted. There is nothing more tyrannical than received wisdom that if you if you question you become a, a pariah you know there has been lot, there are lots of them so the received wisdom for example that all the problems of the middle east start from sykes picot and the post colonial uh, and, the, and the colonial d division of the of the region that's another received wisdom and which is very easy to 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 debunk because in after World War I in uh, Versailles and San Remo and all these, the, 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 the powers, the victors, divided the whole world, including their own territories. And they did a far better job in the Middle East than they did in Europe, uh, because what they did in Europe caused you know, uh, <laughs> World War II and millions and millions of refugees, and the, change, the map changed in Europe far too many times, whereas ours is stable. I don't know how they did it, but they did a, a, and had they left it to our, for us to manage, I don't think we would have, we would still be fighting uh, about this. So, so that's, my, that's my recommendation, that we need to revise the received wisdom of the Iraq war. The Iraq war now teaches us that dictators are better than uh, and stable and hu for human uh, security and all that. And honestly, I think this is a, 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 a abhorrent <laughs> idea. But you don't have to support George Bush in no, order to well, oppose you know, dictatorship. No, I mean, no, I'm not He wasn't the savior. He I know, I know. But this created is, you see, a mess. You, yes, I mean, sometimes a mess, a disruptive mess is, is uh, can, can yield positive results. Not it's, in it's, this uh, particular. Because, because, I mean, what... Not in the cost of millions of people's No, but you see, uh, you see, I, th these are the facts that we need to, 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 to examine, because what happened before the invasion of Iraq, I didn't want to get into this, but if you look at American policy before the invasion of Iraq, George W. H. Bush, the father, uh, allowed Saddam Hussein to massacre tens of thousands of people in 91 after the, the, the Iraq war, af after the liberation of Kuwait. He, 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 um, 
did not come to the, to protect the population. He did not protect the population who thought that they had his protection. And you have, there was, I mean, the sanctions. So instead of liberating the Iraqis from uh, the most brutal dictatorship you can think of, uh, we punished them with sanctions. We punished the people with sanctions. The regime survived very well with sanctions and gained power. You couldn't get an aspirin if you were, didn't belong to the Ba'ath Party, especially after oil for food and, and all that. The, uh, Saddam drained the marshes. There were half a million people living in the marshes. After he drained them and bombed them, there were 50, 60,000 left in, in, in them, you see. So the, when you look at what happened before 2003, uh, it's not, uh, it's, uh, you put things in, in perspective uh, on, on that, and I don't think one should have a single ounce of nostalgia for either Saddam or Gaddafi or, or Bashar or, any, or anyone, because I consider Bashar is already finished anyway. So, so, so that's, that's uh, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but we need to re-examine these, these concepts very seriously. Uh, no, not, not because we're making the future, because the future is being made by the people on the, f on the ground. We have no control over it. We need, our job is to understand it better. And I think academia ha sometimes misunderstands because we're trapped into these concepts and bubbles that we live in. Well, uh, I don't want to here talk mostly as an academic, but mostly talk as, as someone, uh, mostly a political animal. And for that, I think it's certainly quite important to postpone, to, to point to some of the mistreatment that has, some of the catastrophic result that had come out of the war. So it's not that in war, war, one war can have un un unintended consequences. Everything can have an unintended consequences, including our discussion here can have unintended consequences. It is to see exactly what we can do to change the position for better. And for that, certainly, we have to be critical of what has been happening in the past. We have to be critical, critical not only our own mindset, but critical of those power holders that have done, have created such a situation for us. For that reason, certainly for me, being an anti-war means first and foremost to be also anti-American, anti-American policy in the Middle East. Invasion. And until I'm, until in, uh, against invasion. It is, is to discuss that we need to bring some sort of a, some sort of a, uh, power for the people to th to think and to s to speak their mind and to provide some sort of a future, some sort of a solution for future. For this reason is that I think uh, we have to, rather than talk with these terms, we have to think about now that America has been defeated in the Middle East and is leaving it from the Middle East. What else could have happened? What are the what you know, what are the consequences that? It's a different approach toward what might happen. Uh, here's one of the consequences, and, and consequences of uh, European also involvement in, in the Middle East. While the nation states were made up by Europeans, no, regardless, they were made but up I think they are facts on the ground and they are not gonna change. I think it would be sort of wishful thinking that the current nation states are gonna wither away. The current nation states have become more sort of firmly grounded. Iraq, regardless of how fictional it was, is not going to go away. Uh, Syria, regardless of how fictional it was, is not going to go away. And these states are going to become stronger. So this is the reality, interesting reality that we are facing. What was fictional in the pan-Arab discourse is no longer a fiction. It's part of and parcel of a new Middle East yeah. that people are making. Are you uh, going against me? No, no, I'm just general, uh, general We have to allow them to Can speak. I join this with a quick word? Yes, of course. Please go ahead. Yes, okay, look. Um, 
I, I find some of what is being said a little sort of maybe disturbing. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> I, I really, I, I, it really troubles me when I'm always being presented with binaries. It's either Bashar al-Assad or Saddam Hussein or chaos. It's either Qaddafi or chaos. No, there has to be a, a third way. There has to be an alternative. If we're just going to think in binaries, then we're also reinforcing existing paradigms. And that's not right either. There has to be a third way. And we can't constantly think, oh, we can't uh, do this because, you know, of that. Uh, you know, you have to maintain, you know, it's, it's, it's like that trade-off between stability uh, uh, and, and, and security versus uh, your, 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 your uh, personal rights. And somehow, therefore, we become unfit for personal rights because we're not prepared. Uh, these, these, are, uh, these narratives don't sit well with me. The other, the other thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, super-identities, I agree, pan-Arabism, they are the problem. Those super-identities were specifically the problem why we have the kind of issues that we see today. And uh, shared common histories are not super-identities. Shared common histories are the glue that can bring disparate people with different, from different communities, from different backgrounds, from different ethnicities, from different... Uh, that's, that's the glue that can hold them together. Those shared common aspirations, maybe a shared common history that is in the past. It is not to glorify... Obviously, it's been misused by Assad and by the Assads and, and, and by the Sudans to glorify and legitimize their own regimes, but that's not what they're intended for. That's their abuse. That's the way they get misused, and 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 therefore they lose their actual purpose. So for me, you know, the idea that all intervention is bad, or uh, any, you know, or, or or just to blame one one aspect. Look, action has consequences, but inaction has consequences too. What we saw with the Obama administration's uh, mismanagement, I would say, of the. Uh, 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 of what happened in Syria is a classic example of how lack of action, inaction, can have even more catastrophic consequences than action. And, and, and the U.S. is not the only actor in the region. What about the Iranians and their intervention right across the board? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, I don't know. Anyway, uh, that, that's just my point. Okay. We will now... Uh, I know everybody has something to say. I have four pages to read even, but... Let's stop it. Let's stop it here. I hope you all continue that in a written format before. Let's stop it and ask the, uh, ask the audience to ask their questions. Here is the, here is the uh, yes, there's a question out there. Behros, Behros. Yes, Behros. yes, yes. You know, I have also a proposal. Uh, I have also a proposal. We can put this, uh, this, this you know, uh, 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 lecture uh, in a round table and we can publish in Sociology of Islam. This is just a proposal, basically. Okay, okay. We'll think about it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> I have a question or maybe proposal. Uh, why we not talking or we not starting talking earlier than Iran, Iraq wars? Why we, we have, say, 43 years ago, region all over the place is in peace and in calm. I'm not saying that is an ideal situation. What have had started 42 years ago that get to the consequences of what we're seeing today? I mean, we we falling into the Iran-Iraq war, we falling invasion of Iraq, uprising in the Syria, uh, spring of Arab Spring. But go back, go, go back 42 years ago, there has been something have happened on that region which caused all of these movements. Whether it was wrong or right, why, why are we not attacking to that base? Are, are you talking about the Iranian revolution? Exactly. Oh. So the, the, what is interesting, if we put it in a larger global context, the Iranian revolution is that many revolutionary Iranians were based in Iraq, in Yemen, had support from Syria. Some of them were trained in Iraq. So in a sense, in Lebanon, in Lebanon I, I meant uh, Lebanon, actually. Uh, so when you look at the Iranian revolution, it was a revolution 
that the Middle Eastern states participated directly or indirectly by supporting various revolutionary groups. Saudis also, I, I have gone through a lot of uh, letters by Iranian clerics to the Saudis to help save Islam against the Shah of Iran. So in a sense, the kind of alliance that we see in the post-revolutionary period between the Iranian revolutionary state and some of the Middle Eastern states were made, these alliances were made much, much earlier than the coming of the Islamic Republic. So one has to take that into account. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Please, anyone? Yes, back there. And then this lady, yes. Thank you, thank you, Kerry. Uh, thank you, it was a great um, talk. Uh, Professor Kaskin, uh, my understanding of what you said, you put blame of lack of development of democracy and peace in Middle East greatly on the United States. Uh, I share your pessimism. Uh, my understanding of what you said is basically that in last 70 years, the foreign policy of the United States was taken hostage, probably by Israel or by Israel. My question is, first, should we put all blame on the United States and not for the people of the region? Second question is, Israel, we want it or not, is the closest society to democracy in the region. How you can explain this contradiction there? Please answer, Kuskin. Yeah, I'm not sure Israel is a, you know, the purely democratic state. Israel is a security state. Israel, you know, operates as a security <coughs> state in the region. They <coughs> must operate, you know, uh, based on their security and national interests, basically. I mean, I'm not blaming the United States entirely. Also, also of course, you know, the, we have problems in the Middle East. We have many problems in the Middle East. Economic problems, underdevelopment, dictatorship, democracy, peace ethnic discrimination, women uh, participation in the workforce, women participation in the, you know, the, in the education. And we have a lot of problems. But what's the most important problem is, especially in the Cold War, emerge. Uh, in 1959 to 1972, in Turkey, for example, there were 27 US military bases, 30,000 US troops. And they get involved in three military coup in Turkey. 1960, 1972, and 1980, just in Turkey. Imagine this, how Turkey can develop independent foreign policy. As a result today, we have another populist president in Turkey, which is not different than the, any other president or, 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 or other, other, other political system in the Middle East. I mean, I'm not blaming the United, I mean, United States contributed this, 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 this mess in the Middle East greatly, actually. Also, another one, I don't think United States is, I disagree with the Mersheimer and Wolves, I don't think United States foreign policy is designed by the Israeli lobby. United States foreign policy is designed um, and, you know, uh, and, and complicated, uh, uh, it's very complicated uh, the, uh, 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 piece of negotiations between different agencies, different state institutions, the uh, Congress and Senate. Israeli lobby contributes this. I mean, for example, George Bush started the Iraq war in 2003, but Iraq war was designed in 1987 under the Reagan administration. If you look at the, you know, the Iraq archive, how the Iraq archive was moved from University of Colorado to you know, the Kenan Makia, who was the director of that archive in Harvard University, then we will understand you know, the, how Iraq war started actually. Why there was a Iraq war in the first place in 1991 to 1992, if we are blaming the Israel action? United States foreign policy is designed in the longer term period. And now United States foreign policy is changing the East Asia under the Obama administration, not the Trump administration, actually. It is easy to blame the one president, like today, like a scapegoat of the Trump. It's not actually. 
he is responsible on certain things. He cannot change the entire foreign policy of the United States. On, you know, similar to Obama, similar to George Bush, similar to Clinton. If you look at the Clinton 1992 to 2000, he used you know the most neoliberal policies around the world, around the world, and based on the United States national security interests. So, I mean, I disagree with you know this this Israel is designing the entire U.S. foreign policy. You know, this uh, I think this is an obstructor from my perspective. We have five more minutes, so there's one more question out there, and then we will end it. Please. Um, hello, thank you for such a diverse uh, panel uh, today. It was really interesting to listen. My question is for who will have some answer and who will have something to say. Uh, what is uh, your answer to what we should take from this panel? We discuss about different aspects, how we can uh, analyze the peace uh, and democracy in the Middle East. What do you propose to use as variable, uh, as different factors? We discuss about national identity, maybe uh, different uh, political aspects or national aspects or even economic prosperity or interests, interests of different groups, if interests of different states uh, or security uh, variables and so on. In case we further analyze and investigate the peace and democracy in the Middle East, on what we should focus? Can I, you don't Thank mind you. if I answer it very shortly and then you can say something? <laughs> this is our effort to rethink this project. This is the beginning of it. This is not the, it, we don't have it. I'm, the same way that I'm again using uh, Claire is uh, the, um, hope and ambiguity. Is that we are ambiguous in our problems. No Just answer also, No answer is also answer. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not saying no. It's not, I'm not saying there is no answer. I'm saying this is ambiguous to be to start with. What is the importance of it? We are trying to show that these two could be connected to each other. If we connect these to each other, we can come with a solution. I have some what I think might be a solution, but that's that. I don't want to take the time with that. But that's the beginning of an effort on that. Thank you. Well, in the past forty years. My argument, if I want to summarize it, the past four years of political crisis in the Middle East and sort of this chaos in the Middle East, the Saudis have been the financial beneficiaries of the chaos. Iranians have been the political beneficiaries of the chaos and, and, and political crisis. Both the states are facing, because of this, are facing internal crises of their own that they must solve. And in a sense, or they collapse. The Iranians have to go beyond the kind of she exclusion exclusivity the saudis must open up politically and be able to address you know the kind of political rap radicalism that they have exported to afghanistan to syria to iraq and to other places all over the world is coming home and is hunting them and they must solve this and if they are able to solve it the kind of solutions that they are coming up with will be the solution for the rest of the Middle East. And the solution in my comprehension is that per, rather than singular national identity, a plurality of identities, rather than a sing, singular monarchy or theocracy, you have to have a kind of accommodation is political and flexible political institutions that can face the challenge of, of the digital age. Thank you. Let me uh, say two things. No, 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 not, not 30 seconds. No, no, you can, you can talk it later. Uh, 
let me say two things and we'll end up the discussions. Uh, number one is tomorrow, my very good colleague and friend, Dr. Maksud Lu, is showing his film at Mesa. The, uh, the advertisement is outside, and please take a look at it. Maksud Lu is a prominent uh, documentalist. We have made a documentary together on uh, Ardeshir Mohasses, which is a very good one, and I'm very thankful to him for working on that project. Uh, second thing is, please follow us up for dinner at the, uh, we have a nice dinner from Biblos waiting for us at the, li at the library. We'll go all together. Are Thanks. you going to join us too? <laughs> <laughs> and thanks a lot, you guys. Thanks a lot for being very uh, helpful with uh, this discussion. Thank you. <laughs>